Well, good morning and happy Sabbath, everyone. And to our online viewers, I know we have a lot of them. Um, let's start with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, as I open your word, I pray that you will minister to your people through your word. That your Holy Spirit may come now amongst us and use this opportunity to bring healing, direction, and guidance. We hunger for your presence, Lord, and we invite you now in your name. Amen. This morning, my title is The Absent God or the Absent God's Confessions of a Recovering Epicurean. I'm doing the confessing and I'm the Epicurean, just in case it's unclear. Um, <clears throat> and um, I would like to share with you just a little, let's see if this thing works, it does, let's go back one, uh, a little bit about a chap you may not be too familiar with, but he was in our scripture reading. Paul, when he went to Athens, he met with the Stoics and the Epicureans. In the ancient world, the Stoics were the majority, the Epicureans were the minority. Today, most of us are Epicureans without even realizing it. To the extent that if you go to Barnes and Nobles down in South Bend, you go to their religious or philosophy sections, they are offering you Stoicism. That's today's alternative because most of us are by default Epicureans. So let me tell you a little about Epicurus. Uh, and that picture there, I have no guarantees that that actually is him. That's according to uh, Dr. Google. Dr. Google tells me that's him, and I believe Dr. Google. Um, although, uh, as I mentioned this morning, old men look alike, don't they? Yeah, it's like my dad. My dad's 80. He's got this white beard and red skin. Uh, and even though he lives in England, I keep seeing him as I drive around Burying Springs. And I keep waving at him, but he never waves back. Yeah, figure that one out. So, uh, you know, man with beard. There you go. That's him. Um, that's Epicurus. Uh, you can see when he lived, 341 to 270 BC. He was born on the island of Samos, which is off the coast of modern-day Turkey. And... Around about 306, 307 BC, he moved to Athens, now, today's capital of Greece, and he bought a little plot of land outside the city, it had a nice garden, and his teachings became known as the philosophy of the garden. And this tells you a lot about him. Uh, Christians are known as philosophers of the road, the way. Our philosophy is that we are walking always, we're always journeying. journeying. Uh, we are always moving, we're always changing. That's how it's characterized in the book of Acts. But Epicurus, his philosophy was the garden. The world is a jungle, it's nasty, it's brutal. We withdraw from the world to a nice protective garden where we focus on friendship, we focus on developing relationships, and he was known for this. He was known for his letter writing, for his support of his friends, had a whole philosophy of friendship, and he became famous for that. The Stoics, on the, opposite, uh, on the other hand, they integrated with the world. They were started by Zeno, and the Stoia is the marketplace. So they went out and they mixed in the public square. Very, very different philosophy. So this is Epicurus. And uh, what I would like to do is just, uh, I'd like to start by sharing some of his, what we call his physics. So all these philosophers, they, they taught three areas. They taught logic, how do we know what there is? Uh, and then physics. Physics includes the study of theology. I teach in the seminary department, that would be in the physics department. 2,300 years ago. Why? Physics, physical, it's basically the description of everything that, that there is. And then we have ethics. So logic, physics, and ethics. Ethics is, now that I know what there is, how should I live? So they gave a complete worldview. And I would like to share just um, some of his explanations of natural phenomena. 
Okay? And as I read through these, note what is missing. What is missing from these explanations? So this is his explanation of earthquakes. How do earthquakes occur? Earthquakes may be due to the imprisonment of wind underground. So there's wind blowing under the ground. And to it's being interspersed with small masses of earth. So maybe in this bit of wind, there's, it's uh, uh, blowing along some earth, but less here. And then set in continuous motion, thus causing the earth to tremble. And the earth either takes in this wind from without or from the falling in of foundations when undermined into subterranean caverns, thus raising a wind in the imprisoned air, almost like an underground tsunami. Now, that's not too bad an explanation. Okay? Uh, you know, it's not one I follow, but what is missing from this explanation? Remember, he's writing this 2,300 years ago. Let me give you another explanation. Yeah, we're from Michigan. Yeah, we're all very upset because we don't have snow at the moment, aren't we? Yeah, so we're all, Lord, what are you doing to us? Right? Uh, but here we go with snow. Snow may be formed when a fine rain issues from the clouds because of the pores, because the pores are symmetrical and because of the continuous and violent pressure of the winds upon the clouds which are suitable. And then this rain has become, been frozen on its way because of some violent change to coldness in the regions below the clouds. So what is he saying? There's clouds, rain drops out, cold wind comes along, freezes the rain, and now we've got snow. How good an explanation is that? I mean, you're from Michigan. You should be telling me. Yeah, I'm from England. We, 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 we go crazy when there's snow. Even this much, the whole country stops. Right? So there we have It's not too bad. What do we give him? Let's give him 8 out of 10. Now, have a look at this one. Here's your final bit of science for the morning. The rainbow... The rainbow arises when the sun shines upon humid air. How good is that? That's pretty good. Remember, this guy is 2,300 years ago. Or, again, by a certain peculiar blending of light with air, which will cause either all the distinctive qualities of these colors, or else some of them belonging to a single kind, and from the reflection of this light, the air all around will be colored as we see it to be, as the sun shines upon its parts. Hmm. Eight out of ten, nine out of ten almost. That's pretty good. And we could read on. This is Diogenes Lertius. He's writing just after the New Testament is written. That's where we go, one of our major sources for the ancient philosophers. And he gives us an account of uh, most of the Greek philosophers. So and he, we could read more. These explanations of the natural world. And as you read those explanations, what strikes you is this. What is missing from those explanations? God. Any mention of... Now he's Greek. Any mention of God, Zeus, or the rest of them, the gods. No involvement of the gods. That is huge. This is his summary of his teaching. It's called The Four Medicines, the Tetrapharmakos. And uh, this morning I'm going to talk to you about really the first one, maybe the, and the second, four points. Next week we've got a follow-up sermon, got me for two weeks. Uh, we'll be looking at the implications Point three and point four. But here is his first teaching of Epicurus. There's nothing to fear in God. Now, why would he make that so important? Think of an ancient Greek. They get up in the morning and they believe that their world is inhabited by all the gods. There's a God for everything. 
There's a God for the rain, a God for the wind, a God for the thunderstorm. There's a God for the sea. There's a God for the land. There's a God for grain. There's a God for harvest. There's a God for giving birth. There's a God for your cows, a God for everything. Thousands of gods. And your job is to somehow keep these gods happy so they behave themselves. But they haven't given you a book explaining to you how to do it. So it's all trial and error. And bad things happen. And so you are living in fear of the gods, but you've got no mechanism to protect yourself. No way of ensuring that they behave themselves. This is what they call superstition. The gods are the cause of everything. And we are their playthings. And we live in fear of them. Always looking over our shoulder. And Epicurus says, no, no, no. <laughs> you got it wrong. You've misread Homer. You've misread the Iliad. You've got this wrong. Here is what the gods are like. They're not capricious. They're not moody. No, they are perfect. They are beautiful. They are wonderful. And this is how they, they live. We live down here on the earth. Imagine a block of flats, apartment block. Uh, when I was at university, I lived on floor 18 of 20. That's how I got incredibly fit. You know, the, the, the elevator was always full. You know, running up for lunch, running down. Running for my next lecture, running down. Uh, we used to time ourselves. Right? So up to the penthouse suite. Who lives in the penthouse suite? The gods. They're perfect. They're happy. They have everything they need. They're independent and they don't need anything from us. We live on the ground floor. They live on the pen, in the penthouse suite. They don't interact with us. And we don't need anything from them. Hmm. This is the Epicurean worldview. And because they're up there and they're not disturbing us, we've got nothing to fear about them. Oh, but when I die, won't they, won't they judge me? Won't they look at my life? No. Nothing to feel in death. That's the second thing. When you die, you're dead, and that's it. No afterlife. You die, and you're gone. Don't fear about them taking it out on you. Don't fear about judgment. So this is Epicurus. He's reacting to the superstition, the fear of his age, which is prevalent with their paganism their pagan practices and beliefs. And this is what Paul is dealing with. He speaks in chapter 18, chapter 17, to the Stoics and the philosophers. And this is what he says to the Epicureans. He says this in chapter 17, verse 27, so that they would search from God and perhaps grope for him and find him, though indeed he is not far from each one of us. What is he saying to the Epicureans? You think you've pushed God up to the penthouse suite, out of your world, out of your lives. No, he's actually not far from us. That's Paul's response. Now, this is more than a history lesson. Uh, as I was coming in uh, after Sabbath school into the sanctuary, John Markovich, thank you, John, he'd got this book under his... Uh, under his arm and I don't know why you've got it why you brought it John you're going to have to explain that after me but um, uh, this book is a reasonably famous book and it's telling the story it's called The Swerve why The Swerve? because Epicurus taught us that we've got atoms an atom is something that you can't break down into anything smaller they're all moving in one direction yeah, all the atoms are moving in one direction well if, if that's the case how do we have free will? Oh, occasionally they swerve. That's, that's part of his physics. And they came out this book a couple of years back, and it's been relatively popular. It's a bestseller, The Swerve by Stephen Greenblatt. And it's the story of Poggio Bracciolini, 
who was the apostolic secretary to seven popes. Okay. Now, let me just give you a little background on him, right? Just so you can get a feel of the type of guy he was. Right? He, at 56 years old, he's got a mistress and they've got 14 children together. Respect. <clears throat> 14 kids. And then he decides, hmm, I need to get married. But my mistress is too low class. I've got to trade her in. So he moves her out and he marries a 17-year-old. Remember, how old is he? 56. He marries a 17-year-old aristocratic girl and they have six children together. 20 children. Yeah. You know, uh, my mum's from Ireland. Uh, my granny, Iris side, was one of 14. Those were the days, eh? Right, 14 kids. Uh, 20 kids. I understand why he did this. He would go off around the monasteries of Europe, searching. If you had 20 kids, you'd do this, right? <laughs> you'd go off on holiday, right? And I doubt he took his 20 kids with him. Needed a break. So he would go off around the monasteries of France, Switzerland, Italy, looking through their libraries. And in one monastery, we're not sure where, probably Germany, in Germany, he discovered a book by Lucretius on the nature of things. He made a copy. He sent it to a friend in Italy. He lost the copy. His friend made other copies and spread it round. And this book by Lucretius, who was a Roman. Remember, Epicurus was Greek. But Lucretius is writing round about New Testament period. And he was an Epicurean, fighting superstition, fighting spiritual darkness. He calls Epicurus a god. He's come and he's challenged the gods. He saved us from superstition. And Bracciolini and his friends, and remember, these guys are good Catholics, right? They discover, rediscover Epicureanism, and for them, it transforms their culture. And they push it, and it becomes the seeds to what we call the Renaissance. What does it mean, the Renaissance? To be reborn. It is European culture, the intellectuals in Europe saying, oh, you know, we're living under... Judeo-Christianity, let's get back to the Greek and Roman classics of our culture. This happens roughly a hundred years before Lutheranism, before Luther, but it affects our culture to the extent I would suggest that all of us, I know I am, I am a recovering Epicurean. I'm a recovering Epicurean. Superstition. You've all met the type of person, even Christians, who always believe that God is involved in everything. It's either an angel or a devil that caused it. Everything that happens in my life is because of God or Satan. That's one extreme. At the other extreme, we've got the modern day manifestation of Epicureanism. Theologians, they call it moral therapeutic deism. And it goes something like this. Most Western Christians tend to be this. If I live a good life, so we all believe in morality, be good. Not sure why, but be good. The God who has a minimal involvement in my life. If your default idea when you think of God is of someone who is far away rather than close, then we are, you're an Epicurean. The Stoics, their default, when you give them the word God, what's your, what pops into your mind? Oh, a close being, then you're a Stoic. But if by default you think God is far away, you've been bitten by the Epicurean bug. The God who has minimal involvement in my life will give me inner tranquility and remove my anxiety. That is moral therapeutic deism. Let me share with you when I realized I was suffering from a bit of Epicureanism. Okay? Uh, 
When I was a student back in the UK at Newbold doing my, my masters, I had a course on Ellen White. Oh, what can I write on Ellen White that hasn't been done? Or, okay, I'll read through all her letters from 1840s to 1880s. So I went into the Ellen White estate, and there's a couple of rooms there with all the books. I sat down, wooden chair, uncomfortable chair, remember the chair, and I started reading her letters, one by one, all the way through. I read, when I got, when I got to one letter, I almost fell off my chair. This is what I read. Right? This is when Ellen White lived in Michigan. It was a winter. So what did she have? What was there lots of in winter in Michigan? Snow. It was a Sabbath morning. She needed to preach at a church some distance away. Didn't have a car. She would go by sledge, horse-drawn sledge. She gets up that Sabbath morning, got two sons in the home, and one of the sons has gone down sick. Now, I've got two sons. I get up Sabbath morning. I sometimes preach. But if one of them's sick, I don't respond as Ellen White responds. If our sons have a cold Sabbath morning in Michigan winter, I can tell you what the explanation is. Oh, love, why did you let them play outside in the snow without their coats on? Wouldn't that be your explanation? Do you know what Ellen White wrote? She says, I have a message to deliver this morning in that church, and Satan doesn't want me to deliver it. So he's attacked my son. And when I read that, I almost fell off my chair. That would have been the last explanation that would have come into my mind. And it's been bothering me ever since. Why would I come up with a totally different explanation to what she came up with? Have I, without even knowing it, now you go to school and it's all Epicureanism. I mean, you just think of the, the, rain, the water cycle. Yeah, We get the rivers, they go into the sea and what happens? It evaporates. We're all taught this at school, aren't we? And then what does it form? clouds and then they go over the land and then what do they do drop their rain and then down through the rivers ponds lakes into the sea and it goes on and on and on you know I and this was a bit of a crisis because uh, you know we used to follow cricket and you don't play when it's raining and England are normally losing so Englishmen are very good at praying for rain right we, we always thought God sends the rain yeah to save England uh, no, no involvement. It's just like a machine. You taught this at school, always natural explanations. And God, you push him further and further in your experience out. And before you know it, you're an Epicurean, a modern deist. As Adventists, we have a really good response. You've heard of Josephus, maybe, Jewish historian from the time, equivalent, uh, a contemporary of Paul. This is what he says, right? It's almost as if he's a baptized Adventist. Right? He says this, all these things did this man Daniel. He's telling the story of Israel, and he's referring to Daniel, the prophet Daniel, Old Testament, leave in writing, as God had shown them to him in so much that such as read his prophecies and see how they have been fulfilled. Think Daniel 2, the head, the chest, the waist, the legs, and the feet. Saying, think of Daniel's prophecies. Would wonder at the honor wherewith God honored Daniel and may thence discover how the Epicureans are in error, who cast providence by providence, he means the guiding of God. The providence, cast providence out of human life and do not believe that God takes care of the affairs of the world, nor that the universe is governed and continued in being by that blessed and immortal nature. 
What's his argument against the Epicureans? God lives upstairs, we live downstairs. They don't bother us, we don't bother them. And what does he say? No, 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 no. The prophet Daniel tells us through prophecy that God is involved in the affairs of mankind. What's the claim of Daniel? God raises up kingdoms and he pulls them down. He raises them up and he pulls them down. My granddad was a pastor in Hull during World War II when Hull, it's a, it's a port city on the east coast of the UK, was being flattened by the Luftwaffe. Right? And every bit, 1941, England alone left against Germany. And do you know what his sermons were? Hitler cannot win. Why? Because he's not in control. Who's in control? God. How do we know that? Prophecy. It's like he'd been reading from the script of Josephus. As Adventists, we have a great heritage to counteract our culture, which is telling us God isn't involved. That's why prophecy is important. It's a testimony that God is involved in the affairs of mankind. But I would like to make this a little more personal. Not just the affairs of nations, but I'd like to just share with you four points, biblical points. If you're suffering from this sense that God is out of your life, but you know you should believe in him, and you've got the intellectual reasons to believe in him, but you just oh, don't experience him on a day-to-day -day basis, and you know you don't want to become a little superstitious person in fear of everything, right? how can we respond to what the the hand of cards that our culture has dealt us. Here's the first. <laughs> Recognize the reality of the context that we live. What the culture is trying to do to us. That's the first thing we need to do. Our culture affects our Christian experience. It shapes it whether we like it or not. It shaped Jesus. And what he could do. You know the story when Jesus went to Nazareth? Where he grew up? And he preached in the synagogue? You remember that story? And at first they're all, wow, amazed. And then they think, oh, isn't this the son of Joseph? And aren't these his brothers and his sisters? And then they took offense at him. And this is what Mark tells us. He says in Mark 6, 5 to 6, And he, Jesus, could do how many deeds of power? No deeds of power. Zero. No deeds of power. Except that he laid his hand on a few sick people and cured them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. Now, I would be fairly happy if I could lay my hands on a few sick people and heal them, right? But these are the deeds of power which we read about earlier in the gospel. Could do none. What does Matthew do to this? Matthew, maybe he was a little uncomfortable. This idea that Jesus could do no deeds of power, that he was so affected, he was limited by the atmosphere of unbelief that it affected Jesus so much that he couldn't work his power. Matthew, assuming he is using Mark, changes it. And he, Jesus, did not do many deeds of power there because of their unbelief. You can see he's softened it a little, hasn't he? Yeah, it would be nice to have seen those two guys talking about it later, Mark and Matthew. Right? But the culture, the unbelief, affected Jesus. You don't think it's not going to affect us? You know that when you travel around the world, you go to some countries and they have a very different spiritual climate to what we have. And that affects the church, the believers in those countries. And it affects us. So recognize the reality of your context. Uh, <clears throat> second thing I would share is this. Welcome those into your life 
who do know the Lord. Make friends with those who are on fire for the Lord. I know I can count people who've been really influential in my life, who spiritually shaped me. <laughs> there was a guy in Poland when I was a student missionary. I just looked at him and think, he's got something I don't have in his spiritual walk with the Lord. I need to spend time with him. Right? This is Jesus talking to the twelve. This is what he says. He's about to send them out as missionaries into an environment where there is a lack of faith. God's been pushed out of the scene. And he says this, whoever welcomes you, so that's us, we go, whoever welcomes you, they're not just welcoming you, but who are they welcoming? Me. They're welcoming me. They're welcoming you, Mr. Vine. But when they welcome Mr. Vine, they're actually welcoming the one who sent Mr. Vine, Jesus. And when they're welcoming Jesus, they're not just welcoming Jesus, they're welcoming the one who sent me. Who sent Jesus? The Father. I, this verse gave me goose pimples. Goosebumps. Ah, let's get that right. <laughs> Goosebumps. Whenever... I was doing pastoral visits. Whenever you do a visit, you go into somebody's home and you're not just, oh, it's my job, I need to do this. No. God guides our path and he's saying, when I go into this home, it's not just me, I'm an envoy. Paul calls us ambassadors for Christ. We're his ambassadors. We are going and you are to think of yourself I am the presence, not just of Mr. Vine, but the presence of Jesus. Not just the presence of Jesus, but the presence of the Father. In a culture which has pushed God out, there are people walking around who bear the name Jesus and who are the localized presence of Jesus, the presence of the Father. You want to get up close to them if you're a recovering Epicurean. Get up close to them. Spend time with them. And what happens when you do is when you welcome those people into your lives, I mean, it's not just, it's not fair, I know, but you get treated as if you're that person. You bless them, you get blessed. It's the Abrahamic com uh, uh, promise. Whoever blesses you will be blessed and whoever curses you will be cursed. Yet you will receive a blessing. So, recognize the culture. <laughs> Invite people into your lives. Get close to those who are on fire for the Lord. Third point I would share. And this is from the Psalms. You've got your Bibles. Please follow along with me with this Psalm. This is Psalm 77. Psalm 77. Uh, <clears throat> I don't know about you, but I've thoroughly enjoyed our Sabbath school quarter this Sabbath on the Psalms. It's just been wonderful. Remember, the Psalms are your prayer book. <laughs> yeah. Lord, teach us how to pray like John the Baptist has taught his disciples. Oh, and then he gives them the Lord's Prayer. It's a summary of the Psalms. Nothing wrong with your Psalms. Use them. All the Psalms are in the Lord's Prayer and all the Lord's Prayer is in the Psalms. So this is Psalm 77. And let me start at verse 1. I cry aloud to God, aloud to God that he may hear me. In the day of my trouble, I seek the Lord. In the night, my hand is stretched out without wearing. My soul refuses to be comforted. I think of God and I moan, I meditate and my spirit faints. What's the psalmist's situation? Trouble? Life difficulty, whatever it is, it doesn't tell us. But it's of such a magnitude that he believes that actually God is distant. God doesn't care. Have you had those nights when you can't sleep? Yeah. I get one probably about once every six months. Um, yeah, I'm just trying to think the last one. Oh, I know what it was. Blue Mountain. I was preaching at Blue Mountain and I did an appeal and a load of teenagers came forth 
And you know what that does to someone who preaches? It like shoots their adrenaline levels sky high. And I was so excited to see folk saying no to Satan and yes to the Lord that I couldn't sleep that night. And I had to preach the next day. I said, Lord, it's your fault. Yeah, you brought them up, not me. Your fault if I don't sleep because I'm so excited because people are giving their hearts to the Lord. That's your fault. Right? But this isn't the experience here, is it? Right? Um, this, this psalmist is worried, worried about something. Uh, let's read on verse 4 and 5. Got it on the screen there. You keep my eyelids from closing. Now, I don't know whether it really was the Lord, but this is what he's saying you're doing. I am so troubled that I cannot speak. I consider the days of old and remember the years of long ago. I commune with my heart in the night. I meditate and search my spirit. What is he thinking about? Have you seen these little models of, um, uh, of Buddha? You know Buddha? Yeah. Um, middle-aged Buddhas at least. Right? But he's sitting there. I'm not going to do it this morning because I'm past crossing my legs. You know, I'm too dignified right, at my age. But imagine I could cross my legs, get down. Where, does it, where is Buddha looking? Here. He's inward looking, inward focused. This is what the psalmist is at this point. He's considering, my, as he says, my heart. He's searching my spirit, his days of old. He's thinking about his life. He's like Buddha, inward focus, thinking about what's gone on in the past. And then he cries out, verse 7, Will the Lord spurn forever and never again be favourable? Has his steadfast love ceased forever? Are his promises at an end for all time? Has God forgotten to be gracious? Has he in anger shut up the compassion? His compassion. And I say, it is my grief that the right hand of the Most High has changed. He's focusing on his life, and he has this overwhelming sense of the distance, the absence of God. That's a major theme in our culture, the absence of God. And he's experiencing it at that moment as he meditates upon his life. Here's the solution, or one solution. Meditate on the deeds of the Lord. This is an amazing psalm. Right? It's like medicine for the discouraged soul. Verse 11. Everything changes. I will call to mind the deeds of the Lord. Not my own deeds, but the deeds of the Lord. I will remember your wonders of old. I will meditate on all your work and muse on your mighty deed. Instead of being inward focused, I'm going to raise my eyes and now I'm going to meditate not what I've done, but what you've done. Everything changes. Instead of God being far and absent, absent and hostile, Verse 13, your way, O God, is holy. What God is so great as our God. You are the God who works wonders. You have displayed your might among the peoples. With your strong arm, you redeemed your people, the descendants of Jacob and Joseph. Wow, what an amazing God we serve. Confessions of a recovering Epicurean. Change what you're meditating upon. Instead of being preoccupied with your own life, be preoccupied with the life of the Lord and his deeds. Well, what should I meditate upon? <laughs> and so he gives us what he's been thinking about. I mean, imagine this. Sleepless night, we're told to do what? Count sheep. Yeah, isn't that what you do when you can't sleep? You count sheep. So they're jumping. One sheep, two sheep, three sheep, four sheep. Right? No. When you can't sleep, this is what you do. Right? You think about this, verse 16. When the waters saw you, O God, 
When the waters saw you, they were afraid. The very deep trembled. The clouds poured out water. The skies thundered. Your arrows flashed. I, this would actually wake me up, you know. But anyway, better to be awake with the Lord than, than uh, yes, otherwise. The crash of your thunder was in the whirlwind. Your lightnings lit up the world. The earth trembled and shook. Your way was through the sea, your path through the mighty waters. What event is he thinking of? The Red Sea. One of the most amazing events. That was me, says the Lord. Meditate upon my works. And just when you think you've caught the Lord in your experience... What does he say? End of verse 19. At that moment when the Lord's presence is most manifested, yet your footprints were unseen. You can never bottle the Lord and capture him. So he's there in all his power and yet he's unseen. You led your people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. You still used human agency. Hmm. Lift up your eyes. Meditate on the deeds of the Lord. I have one final psalm I would like to share with you. Um, Psalm 107. Psalm 107. For those of us who are recovering Epicureans, who've pushed God out of our daily walk, out of our daily experience, let's listen to Psalm 107. Why this is a special psalm for me is this reason. Um, when I was pastoring, I moved from one district to another. I went to a district called Derby. It's in, bang in the centre of England. It's where they make Rolls-Royce aero engines. You know, that power the um, uh, our planes. Uh, and um, uh, we had two churches in the town. And in one of the churches, when I went, they said, Pastor, no preachers on the last Sabbath of the month. Right? We don't want a sermon. He's like, What? Never heard of a church of not having one out of every four Sabbaths with no sermon. I thought people came to church to hear the preacher. Isn't that right? Oh, I know why you're here. That's how it should be. And I was thinking, well, what are you going to do on those four Sabbaths? Pastor, it's our testimony Sabbaths. It's when we as members... Testify to what the Lord has done during the previous month. You know, now I like to think that my six years in, uh, in Derby helped transform that church. Yeah, we grew a wonderful church. But you know what I really suspect is? I suspect it was their testimony Sabbaths. All month they're looking for the fingerprints, the hand of God in their day to day experience. And then on Testimony Sabbath, they come. And you know, that was the longest service of the month because everybody wanted to stand up. Now, we're not going to let everybody stand up this morning and give their testimony, but we're going to hear four testimonies in Psalm 107. Here's how it goes. Verse 2. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, those who redeem from trouble. We need the redeemed to stand up in the congregation and share how the Lord has come into your life and been present and active. So here is the first group who stand up. Verse 4. Some wandered in desert wastes, finding no way to an inhabited town, hungry and thirsty. Their soul fainted within them. What's their problem? They're lost. They don't know where they're going in life. Now, it's not nice to be lost, is it? Yeah? Back in October, I was, <laughs> um, I was in Poland teaching at the seminary, and there's woods nearby, and I went for every day for a walk. And one of the days, I asked someone, where am I on the map? They have these maps, right? And they showed me where I was. 
But if I went for my walk? And uh, I didn't get back till three hours later. I'd been round all the villages, didn't know where I was, and the reason was they had told me the wrong place on the map. So in my head, I was one place, but in fact, I was another place. Right? It's not nice. It, when you're lost in the car, it doesn't matter, does it? As long as you've got enough petrol. Right? But you're walking, you're lost. Oh, boy, it's frustrating. Here we have someone who's wandering in desert wastes. It's a metaphor, someone going through life and they don't know where they should be going. Here's what they do, verse 6. They cried to the Lord in their trouble and he delivered them from their distress. Whoa. Listen to someone who's been, received guidance from the Lord. Verse 8. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love. We won't read all the verses. Second testimony, verse 10. Second group, stand up. Some sat in darkness and in gloom, prisoners in misery and in irons. What's their situation? Their spirit, their soul has hit rock bottom. We'd probably call it depression today. For they had rebelled against the words of God and spurned the counsel of the Most High. Their hearts were bowed down with hard labor. They fell down with no one to help them. It's just darkness. You can see no light. Verse 13. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble and he saved them from their distress. I've seen that occur. God brings hope. Even not at the personal level, at least you know he's in control of the nations. And that gives hope for the individual. Verse 15. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love. So we've had the one who's lost. We've had the one in darkness. Here's the third. Verse 17. Some were sick through their sinful ways and because of their iniquities endured affliction. That sort of makes sense, doesn't it? Right? You just live a certain lifestyle. Don't be surprised when the roosters come home. Right? What you sow, you reap. You don't need to believe in God. You can be an Epicurean and believe that. They loathed any kind of food and they drew near to the gates of death. Verse 19, then they cried to the Lord in their trouble and he saved them from their distress. And what did they do? Verse 21, let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love. We've had the lost, we've had the depressed, we've had the self-imposed sick, and then we've got the final group, right? I don't know where you are, where I am. This is where we need to meditate upon this psalm. But the final group pretty much catches everyone else. And it goes like this. Some went down to the sea in ships doing business on the mighty waters. They are simply going through life, day by day, doing their business. These are merchants going from port to port. Probably quite successful people. They know what they're doing. They've got their careers mapped out. And the Lord brings a storm into their lives. This is what we read, verse 24. They saw the deeds of the Lord, his wondrous works in the deep. For he commanded and raised the stormy wind and lifted up the waves of the sea. It doesn't mean that every storm is caused by the Lord. But if the Lord needs a storm to stop someone and catch their attention, he will send a storm. And that's what he does. They mounted up to the heavens. They went down to the depths. You can just imagine them in their boat in a terrible storm. Their courage melted away in their calamity. They realized the limits of their capacity. 
They reeled and staggered like drunkards and were at their wits' end. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble and he brought them out from their distress. He made the storm be still. Verse 31, let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love. We've had the lost, we've had the depressed, we've had the sick, and then we've had the successful. If you're a recovering Epicurean, listen to the proclamation of the redeemed. Listen to how God has been involved in the lives of others and join in giving thanks. The psalmist finishes by capturing the theology of what he's saying. Verse 33, he turns rivers into a desert, springs of water into a thirsty land. Yep. For us here in the US, what is he saying? He's saying that he turns Michigan into Arizona. He turns the green into the desert. Verse 35, he turns a desert into pools of water, a parched land into springs of water. He can turn Arizona back into Michigan. This is a God who's involved. He's involved in social affairs. Verse 40, he pours contempt on princes. Verse 41, he raises up the needy. He can turn societies upside down. You listen to the testimonies of the saints who've been redeemed. Verse 42, and this is what it does. The upright see it. The involvement of God in the affairs of humanity. And they are glad. And all wickedness stops its mouth. It shuts up the wicked. I don't know whether you're like me, a recovering Epicurean, but it's something that our culture has given us, whether we like it or not. And if you're in that situation, I appeal. Be realistic. Recognize what your culture's doing. We need to recognize what our culture's doing to us. Welcome those into your lives who bear the name Jesus. Meditate upon the deeds of the Lord. Less of me, more of him. And then finally, listen to the thanksgiving, to the joy, the joy of the proclamation of the redeemed. And my prayer is, is that the upright will hear it and be glad and the wicked won't have anything to say. May we be a place, a community, saints, where God is actively present. May we resist what our culture is doing to us. And may we seek God daily. This is my invitation today. Amen.